hold on, we're gonna get started in just one second. Simon, while we're waiting, how did you have, are you a London? Like to give us a 30 second overview of yourself, if you don't mind, while we're waiting, because this is taking a little bit longer to set up than I thought. Yes, of course. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from London. It is afternoon here, 3 p.m., but good morning to most of you. Uh, my name is Simon Whitehouse. I'm a London Blue Badge tourist guide, which means I'm a qualified tourist guide for London. And I'm a storyteller, really, a storyteller of all things to do with London's history and culture. And I'm from Shropshire originally, which is a county uh, sandwiched between England and Wales in what is known as the Midlands. So that's where I'm from originally. But I've, I've been a Londoner for over 20 years five years and um, really looking forward to sharing medieval London with you this afternoon. Okay, awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get started. It's all yours, Simon. And thanks to you for joining us and thanks for everyone else who's here participating. Excellent. So, well, I've given you a very brief introduction uh, of myself. So yes, I'm Simon Whitehouse, London Blue Badge Guides. And really since the beginning of April, I guess, last year, 2020, when, of course, the world changed. Uh, we tourist guides had to think of a new way of bringing the world to our visitors. And we uh, have done this using technology, using the wonderful technology of virtual tours. And in conjunction with London Walks, which is the oldest and best walking tour company in London, uh, established for over 50 years, we have been bringing a huge wide ranging program of virtual tours and walks via Zoom. And what I'm going to share with you this afternoon for a, about an hour or so is the story of medieval London. And this story is part of a wider story that in fact we have been doing as a series via London Walks. And uh, it's, it's an eight part series called The Story of London. So it starts with Roman London, then it goes into Anglo-Saxon London, then medieval London, and then the Tudors and then the Stuarts and the Georgians and the Regency right up to the Victorian period. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it um, at the end of our tour today. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Robert is going to be my studio manager uh, today, just to <laughs> make you. sure that everything's in uh, in good working order. So I'm just going to click on the screen here. Just takes a moment to uh, set things up right here. So just give me a second to do that. Okay, so with a bit of luck there, Robert, you should be able to see the title page. Yes, I can, thank you. That's what, so that's the title page you just saw. So that's just a reminder of who we are. Walks.com is the uh, website that uh, we uh, direct you to. And my uh, individual contact details just below. We'll bring that, that up again at the end. But medieval London. And I like to give you a time frame because uh, we need to know when we're talking about here. Now, you know, the medieval period can be slightly um, interpreted in lots of different ways. But for our purposes, we're talking about the period from 1066 AD to 1485 AD. So it's about um, 300, uh, well, 400 years uh, approximately. Now, what do we think of when we think of medieval London? Well, I just thought I'd bring up some um, images here. So these are some of the things we're going to be talking about on our medieval London tour today. Um, most people think of gloom and doom when they think of the Middle Ages. It's not a time when we really necessarily wanted to be alive. It's a time of famine and of pestilence, uh, plague, torture, generally life not too good for most people. And whilst that is certainly true, um, it's, not the, it's not the complete story. And hopefully I'll be giving you the sense that London was also um, a place of fun in the Middle Ages as well. But uh, those images that you can see there of uh, those are medieval chess pieces, medieval footwear, medieval acrobats, and indeed Her Majesty the Queen involved in what is a medieval ceremony. 
So those are just some of the things we're going to be touching on today in our tour. And what I hope is that if you if you're regular visitors to London, uh, if you have been, and I know that many of you have been to London many times, uh, some of you have even already been with London Walks, um, that it'll remind you of some of the great uh, places that you might have visited. If you've never been to London before, don't worry, because hopefully this will give you a little primer uh, about this particular period of London's history, and it will kind of entice you to all of the places that you can visit which are linked to uh, this period of history. And if you are Londoners um, joining us today, hopefully you probably know quite a lot about the story of London, but this will hopefully enrich uh, your understanding a little bit further. So if you have questions, I think Robert has already said, but you can put your questions into the chat. Robert will keep an eye on them and probably towards, well, at the end, we'll, we'll give a time for uh, answering questions and uh, sharing. But if anything really uh, uh, urgent comes up, then I'm sure Robert will alert me to that. Okay. All right, so we're gonna start now with uh, a little bit of geography because we need to understand what we really mean by medieval London and what you see now on the screen is a map of medieval London about midway through the period that we're going to be talking about so we're talking 1300 AD and London is broadly divided into three distinct areas so you've got the River Thames that's the blue bit at the bottom of the map and just to the north of that you can see that light pink area and that is the city of London. In fact, that is really what, what is London in the Middle Ages. It was founded by the Romans 2000, AD, uh, 2000 years ago, 43 AD. Uh, they stayed for about 350 years. They built a wall, which in fact you can still see the boundary of in that image uh, in black. They left, it was resettled by the Anglo-Saxon people. Um, and by the year 1066, which is when our story is going to start today, um, the country is invaded by the French Normans uh, in the, um, it, after the Battle of Hastings with William the Conqueror. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but this, this map is, is after that period. Um, so the city of London is the mercantile center. It's a thriving mercantile center. And that's where the majority of people live. Now, if you look down to the bottom left of the map, I'm going to point to it with my cursor, you can see there's an area known as Westminster, and that's an entirely separate area to London at this time. And there is a palace there and there is a church which is going to become the centre of government uh, during this period. And connecting the two areas is a very long street called the Strand, which we're going to be touching on again a little bit later. But all these areas are still very familiar to us today as modern Londoners. And if we go across the river, just down here to the south side of the River Thames, we come to an area called um, Southwark. Um, and that is a, a, a suburb, if you like, really. And you'll see that leads out of the city of London and down towards the southeast of England. And again, we're going to be visiting that area a little bit later on our tour. Um, now, at the beginning of our period, the population of this London is around 40,000 people. Um, it will grow to about 100,000 people by the time that this map is um, drawn up, or this is sort of modern interpretation of the map, but it's about 100,000 people by 1300. And the Black Death, the, the plague in 1348, wipes out about um, half to maybe two thirds of the population. So we're back down to about maybe 60,000 people by 1348. Um, and what you have to imagine is that if you'd been visiting uh, London, it, it would have been a spectacle. You'd never seen a city like it if you came from the countryside. You'd never seen so many houses. Uh, some of the streets were 20 feet wide, which would have been extraordinary at the time. The river would have been teeming with hundreds of boats. And don't forget, it, it was an international city. So you had merchants coming from all over Europe although Europe didn't really exist as a concept at the time, but uh, the Baltic, the Mediterranean. Um, so probably, you know, you have 100,000 people at any given time um, in an area 
here, which is really no more than one square mile. So just imagine all those people really packed in tight. Um, and that's 100,000 bowels to evacuate, just to remind you, with no modern sewage system. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, and there are animals running everywhere. So you've got, you know, of course, rats, you've got pigs, you've got dogs, they're, they're, they're domestic animals that people keep in their houses. So, so it's, it's basically, it's a riot of, of smell and sound and, and color uh, and possibly even noisier. Uh, and more vibrant than um, the London that we know today. Okay, so we're going to begin our medieval London tour by heading over here to the right. Now, just on the eastern edge of the walled city is this terrifying building, and it's called the Tower of London. Here's a view of it as it looks today, and you can see that it's still the largest surviving and oldest, in fact, medieval building that we have in London, but it has evolved quite a bit since it was first built. So what's the story behind the Tower of London? Well, we need to start with the year 1066. And in 1066, William the Conqueror, who is a French Norman king, defeats the last of our native English kings, the Anglo-Saxon king, King Harold, at the Battle of Hastings. And William the Conqueror marches with his Norman army all the way up to London, has no trouble um, entering the city, and he decides that he's going to ensure that the native people understand now that he is in charge. And one of the ways that he exercises his power is to build a castle, a fortification, a fortress on the north bank of the River Thames, overlooking that mercantile city that's already been established. So it's kind of like a warning shot to the native Anglo-Saxon people. Um, now, what you see today really is, is a, a much larger complex than William the Conqueror would have known, but this is the building that's at the heart of the complex and it's called the White Tower. And this is the tower that was built by William the Conqueror. Now, originally it would have been a wooden structure, so it would have been a wooden building, but it would have been replaced by this stone building starting in 1078. And it took about 20 years to construct the White Tower. So actually William the Conqueror did not live to see it being completed. But um, what you can appreciate just from looking at that image is that as an Anglo-Saxon person, you have never seen a castle before. Castles didn't exist in England, and you've never seen a building that is built out of stone, because all the Anglo-Saxon buildings were built out of wood, so this was a shock as well. And those towers that you see are 90 feet tall. You've never seen a building that tall before. Um, so I guess it would be like an alien spaceship uh, landing in your backyard today. That's the effect that this building would have had on the native people at the time. Now, if we just go a little bit closer to the building, we can see that there are those uh, rounded windows and you can see that some of them are very small. Those are the original windows from the 11th century. They did actually build bigger windows later on um, in history, but th those are the, uh, that's the original size of the windows. And just here, um, difficult to see on the image, but that, that is stained glass there. And if we go just into the building itself, beyond that stained glass, we would find the most wonderful chapel. And this is one of a handful of surviving Norman chapels from the 11th century in England. And what you notice is these beautiful rounded arches. So this is the new style of architecture that the Normans bring in. It's called uh, Romanesque, so it's in the Roman style, rounded arches, but it's also known as Norman architecture. Um, and of course, this would have been next to the main hall, the main chamber, where in fact the king would have resided in the building. So that's the interior of the chapel at the Tower of London, which of course is still, you know, it's, it's one of our major tourist attractions today, and it's one of the highlights of visiting the Tower of London. Um, just to give you an idea of what it looked like during its construction, uh, just on the left there, you can see the Anglo-Saxon buildings. So the Anglo-Saxon buildings are just one story in height. They're made of wattle and daub, so effectively um, plaster with timber frames and thatched roofs. And then 
those poor Anglo-Saxon people are going to be press ganged into constructing the tower. Um, so, so it's really a symbol of the king's power. And also, of course, it protects the entrance into London from enemies coming up the river. So it's both a fortress and a royal palace. And just to give you a reminder, there is the uh, a little image from the Bayer Tapestry, which was the um, embroidery that was created to depict the story of the Battle of Hastings. Now, not only did the tower have, um, you know, it, it was built of stone, it was modern in that sense, but it also had modern facilities. And this is one of the smallest rooms in the tower and the oldest loos that we have in London. This is a garderobe. So you can just imagine William the Conqueror sitting his backside on this. Um, but this was a, a modern idea. So, so, so the, the poop went down the hole and outside down the walls of the Tower of London. Now, the Normans um, basically subjugate the Anglo-Saxon people, not just in buildings, but also in terms of language. So they bring the French language over to England and French language becomes the language of the state for the next 300 years until really the late 1300s. And this still has an impact on very much the English language today. So probably about a third of the words that we have in the English language are derived from French at least. And this is a really good example. So the Anglo-Saxon people are forced to work the land by their Norman um, overlords. So English words, Anglo-Saxon words, um, we still have like cow and pig. So those are the animals that are actually farmed. But the people that eat at the table are the French and their words, boeuf, give us beef and pork, pork. So the meal. So we kind of have this, this class divide in the language um, as well. So I think that's so interesting that, that that's one of the legacies as well um, in the language. Now we're going to move over from the Tower of London and we're going to move right across the city over to Westminster and we're going to talk a little bit about the influence that the Normans had on government. So there's a view today of the city of Westminster and I just thought uh, I'd give you a little sort of aerial view there so you can see the buildings. So just there to the left, you can see Westminster Abbey, and that is the Royal Church. We're going to be talking a little bit about that in a moment. Um, just over to the right here, this is the Palace of Westminster. This is the seat of government today in the United Kingdom, uh, home to the House of Commons and the House of Lords. But I just want you to um, notice as we go around on this little video that you've got this building here with, with a big roof. That's called Westminster Hall. You've got a building that's just sitting um, over there, which is actually a medieval tower. Um, and then you've got uh, Westminster Abbey, which is essentially a medieval building. So, so, we, so I, what the point I'm trying to make is that we are still surrounded by these medieval uh, buildings and institutions very much today. So let's just uh, clarify that a little bit more. So this is a map of medieval Westminster. Uh, and right from the time of the Norman invasion, and even just before the Norman invasion, uh, Westminster was the administrative seat of the government. And where the Palace of Westminster is today, the, today the Houses of Parliament, this was the main seat of the monarch. Um, but it wasn't the permanent seat of government. Um, the government actually did move around um, the country until really about the 1330s, when it then becomes the permanent seat of government. Um, it becomes the headquarters of parliament and there you've got a French word again you know parler, parlement literally the talking place or the speaking place it's also the home of the exchequer so the finance department l'exchequer l'exchec that's a French word uh, the law courts are there uh, the royal chapel's located there the prince of Wales lives there uh, the queen has her own um, chambers there so it's very much at this time a royal residence um, and it actually remains a royal residence right up until the 1500s, so a little bit outside of our time period, uh, when it actually suffers a terrible fire and King Henry VIII moves out of the Palace of Westminster and makes it um, the permanent home of Parliament. Um, so there's the Palace of Westminster and here is the big complex 
that comprises Westminster Abbey, but we're going to talk more about the Abbey in a moment. But I mentioned Westminster Hall, um, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. So now on the screen, you can see two images. You can see Her Majesty the Queen on the left-hand side. We'll come back to her in a minute. But on the right-hand side, you can see the interior of Westminster Hall. Now, William the Conqueror's son, William II, actually built the building you can see there on the right. And he built it out of, again, French Norman stone between 1097 and 1099. Um, and it was where everything really happened in Palace of Westminster. Now, the interior that you see was remodeled by a later medieval king called Richard II, who we'll meet again later um, in the late 1300s. And he created this magnificent double hammer beam roof. And it's the actually it's the largest single span roof in any building anywhere in Europe. Um, and a man called Henry Yevelet oversaw the design of it. And Geoffrey Chaucer, who gave us really the beginnings of modern English, was also involved in the project. But we'll talk about that again a little bit later. Um, and remember I said that uh, Parliament is really conducted in French right up until 1362. And it's in 1362 that we get the first Parliament opened in English. Um, so, so it actually takes 300 years um, from moving from French to English. But the reason I've put Her Majesty the Queen there is because almost every year we have something called the State Opening of Parliament, where the monarch reads out what the government has planned for us for the parliamentary year ahead. Um, it's called the Queen's Speech, and the Queen signs off effectively. She gives royal assent to all of the bills that are passed. At the end of each bill, the Queen still today reads out La Reine Leve, which is Norman French, and it means the Queen wishes it or the Queen wills it. So the legacy of the French language is still with us today in um, the Queen's speech in Parliament. And the Queen, of course, you might know, um, speaks fluent French. So possibly that's an echo from her ancestor, uh, William the Conqueror, from, from uh, all those centuries ago. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, another nice image of Westminster, uh, it, it was effectively built on an island surrounded by three bodies of water. So we've still got the River Thames today where the Parliament building sits, but in the Middle Ages there would have been rivers running on that side and a river running down that side. So effectively it was an island. In fact it was known actually as Thorny Island because once upon a time it was covered in bramble bushes. But you can see it was it was really a, a very separate city um, in its own right. Now I mentioned that there was a, a, another medieval building um, which still survives today and that is that building you can see on the screen and that's called the Jewel Tower and that was built in the 14th century in the reign of King Edward III and it was essentially built as a storage chamber for precious items including things like you know maybe tapestries of course which which adorn the walls of castles and um, houses but also um, gold plate for example um, and also briefly in fact the crown jewels so the reason i put that there is that that building along with westminster hall those are the only two surviving buildings from the medieval period the rest of the palace of westminster burnt down in a fire in 1834 so although the building looks the whole building looks medieval in fact it's a 19th century reconstruction of um, the medieval Gothic style. So uh, when you walk along by the Houses of Parliament, look out for the Jewel Tower uh, next time you're there. Now you can just see, just to the right of the Jewel Tower, you can see the Twin Towers of Westminster Abbey. And we're going to go now around the other side, outside the front of Westminster Abbey, or the West Front. Um, and we're actually going to go and ins explore inside Westminster Abbey. So Westminster Abbey is the royal church. Now, the first church was built here just before William the Conqueror defeated King Harold in 1066. It was built by the previous king, Edward the Confessor. And it was built in, again, the Romanesque style with those um, you know, rounded arches. Um, and when William the Conqueror defeated King Harold, in fact, he had himself crowned 
in the old Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day, 1066. Uh, and since that time, every king and queen of this country has been crowned on that site, except for two Edwards. One Edward was Edward VIII, who of course was our king in the 1930s, and he was the king that abdicated um, after nine months. So he didn't actually make it to a coronation before he abdicated. And the other Edward that didn't get crowned, we're going to leave until the end of our story uh, today. So the church that we see today is in fact a later construction, and it was built, most of it, in the early to mid 1200s in the reign of King Henry III. Now, don't worry too much about all the names of the kings and queens that I'm giving you, because there were actually 19 kings um, between 1066 and 1485, so it's an awful lot to cover. So, so don't worry too much, but we will focus on, on some of them um, in more detail. Um, so let's go a little bit closer to it. So th uh, this is the where you enter the church to go to services still today. It's still very much a, a working church, first and foremost. And Notice the pointed arch again. So by this point, we have got the Gothic style very firmly established in England, the pointed arch versus the rounded arch. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that again later. But uh, if you've never been to London, Westminster Abbey must be on your list. Here's the inside of it. Just look at it. Isn't it absolutely extraordinary? We're looking now into the, the main body of the church, of course, the nave. and it would have cost Henry III about 10% of the income of the nation, um, about £41,000. And just look at the height of that ceiling, because it's still today the highest ceiling of any church in the country, about 100 feet, about 30 some metres. And Henry III rebuilt it because he wanted it to house the remains of Edward the Confessor, that 11th century king, but he also wanted it to be a place where he could be buried and his medieval successors to be buried. So quite a number of our medieval kings um, after Henry III are buried in Westminster Abbey. Now you'll notice just to the right here is a portrait and that's a portrait of King Richard II who was king from 1377 to 1399. So again, about halfway through our period. And I, the reason I, I point out that painting is because it's the oldest surviving medieval painting we have. It's the oldest surviving image of an English king. And it was painted for his coronation in Westminster Abbey. Um, and I'm just going to bring in a close up of the painting so that you can see it. Um, so just notice he's sitting on a wooden chair. He's holding the orb in his one hand, which is a symbol of kingship. And he's holding the scepter in the other. And he's wearing his coronation robes of ermine and um, velvet. And actually, King Richard was not only crowned here. He was um, the first monarch to be married in Westminster Abbey. And he was also buried here as well. So he started a very long tradition of royal weddings at Westminster Abbey. The last royal wedding we had, of course, was William and Kate back in 2011. And by the way, just notice what he's wearing on his feet, a little bit of a diversion here into medieval fashion. He's wearing pointy shoes and they're called poilans. And we think they were introduced from Poland by his wife, Anne of Bohemia. Um, and this is what they look like close up. This, they're in the Museum of London. And these were very fashionable shoes, particularly for the um, king and the aristocracy. And look at the length of those points. I mean, sometimes they were sort of, um, you know, um, 24 inches in length. I mean, they were absolutely impractical to wear. Um, and sometimes they were so long that you had to put a little attachment from the toe all the way up to your uh, calf uh, so that you could physically walk. Um, but they were considered to be extremely decadent, as we'll discover a little bit later. So that's a little bit of medieval footwear for you. Um, now, uh, we're going to actually just move to the right of that portrait of King Richard II to show you one of the greatest treasures in Westminster Abbey and arguably the most important piece of medieval furniture, maybe even in the Western world itself. And here it is. This is the coronation chair. And the coronation chair uh, dates to the very late 
twelve hundreds. Well, actually, about sort of twelve, about thirteen hundred, let's say. Um, and the reason it was built, um, this man is responsible for it. This is King Edward the First, and King Edward the First was again a medieval king who was descended from William the Conqueror through a sort of without going into all the detail, but he was descended from uh, William the Conqueror. And he was um, known as the Hammer of the Scots. Now, remember, England and Scotland are separate countries at this time with separate monarchies. And he liked nothing better than to wage war on Scotland. And in one particular incursion into Scotland in 1297, he brings, steals effectively, a slab of stone from Scotland, which was called the Stone of Schoon. And the Stone of Schoon, was what the medieval Scottish monarchs had been crowned on for centuries beforehand. And he decides that he's going to have this chair made and have the stone fitted underneath. So where you see the lions there at the bottom of the chair, that's where the stone of Schoon was located. So literally for 700 years, from 1297 to 1997, um, every monarch that was crowned sitting on that chair had their feet on the stone of Schoon. So that was a really strong political message. Um, and uh, in case you're wondering where it is today, by the way, in 1997, it was decided it was about time we gave it back to Scotland. So in a very a prestigious ceremony, it was given back to Scotland. And if you want to go and see it, it's in Edinburgh Castle today. But just think of all the royal butts that have sat on that seat since the first monarch was sat there in 1307. Absolutely extraordinary. And although um, obviously it's faded quite a lot today, it would have originally been gilded and painted with, with probably an image of Edward the Confessor on the back of it. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's uh, now of course it's, it's housed in a side chapel today in the Abbey, but it will be brought out for the next coronation. I don't forget, of course, the last coronation we had was, was 1953 uh, and the Queen's still going strong, but it will be brought out for the coronation of King Charles or possibly King William um, after that or both. So there it is. Now, we're going to move outside the church, and this is a wonderful little secret that most people don't know about, but Westminster Abbey not only has these wonderful treasures inside, but it has the most wonderful garden. In fact, it actually has three gardens, and on certain days of the week when you visit Westminster Abbey, the cloister garden, which you can see here, is open to the public. Now, what you need to understand is that when the church was first built on the site, there was in fact a monastery on the site in the, well, actually going back to the 10th century. And Westminster Abbey was a monastic foundation and medieval monks would have been growing herbs and soft fruit trees, grape vines. Unbelievably, we made wine um, in England up until about 1300, uh, when we had a slightly more uh, Mediterranean climate, unbelievably, and the vines actually grew very easily. And of course, because it was a closed monastic community, they, they had a herbal garden where they could grow medicines and plants to treat themselves when they got sick or um, ill. But it's open usually three days a week, and it gives you a wonderful view of the abbey itself from, from the garden. And of course, the abbey holds um, wonderful um, events in the garden as well. So that just gives you a little bit about the monastic foundation. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, monks a little bit later, because obviously the church completely dominated people's lives in the Middle Ages. Now, I've talked a little bit about King Henry III, who built Westminster Abbey. Um, his son was Edward I, who went up to Scotland and brought the Stone of Schoon down and built the coronation chair. But they also, during their reigns in the early to late 1200s, extended the Tower of London. So we're going to go back to the Tower for a moment just to see what's happening there. So there in the middle is William the Conqueror's original fortress. But Henry III decided to extend the fortress by building this wall that I'm just tracing with the cursor now. Um, in the early to mid 1200s um, and actually added 13 towers and turrets all the way along that wall 
And then Edward I, at the end of the 1200s, decides to add an outer wall and adds a further nine towers to the outer wall. So actually, the Tower of London that we know and love today, its physical appearance essentially dates back to this period, essentially 1300. Um, although it's been it's been tweaked about a little bit since then, but that's the basic shape. And you'll notice, of course, that um, there would have been a moat all the way around the tower right up until the 19th century, when in fact the moat was finally drained for the last time. So that would have been another protective layer. Uh, the other thing that arrived at the Tower of London in the same period were animals. And unbelievably, there were over 60 different species of animals living at the Tower of London for 600 years. But the elephant arrives in the reign of King Henry III. Now, can you imagine as a, a Londoner, you've never, seen, you've never seen an elephant before, you don't know what an elephant is, uh, and you go to the Tower of London and, and there it is in its own cage. Not just an elephant, by the way, but a polar bear was also living at the Tower for three years in the middle of the 1200s until it died because it couldn't uh, get used to the climate. Um, so it was essentially a royal menagerie, a private zoo at the Tower of London. And these were gifts that were given to the medieval kings from um, usually foreign kings. The polar bear was actually given by the King of Norway. And I mention that because still today, of course, when you know, uh, we have a state visit from a visiting president or a, a visiting monarch or head of state, uh, they will bring a gift for for the Queen. Uh, and she has had actually, even in her reign, she's had animals gifted to her from particularly from Africa. Um, heavens, heaven knows what I think, I think I think you have to stay back in Africa. I don't think they're allowed to actually um, come to England because of the quarantine. Now, speaking of Her Majesty the Queen, we're going to take a little side trip now, just slightly outside of London, uh, to the county of Berkshire to visit Windsor Castle. Here's an aerial view of Windsor Castle. Now, Windsor Castle is situated 25 miles outside of London, and that's important because here's the complex here. Guess what? The first Windsor Castle was built by William the Conqueror back in the 11th century, and 25 miles was a day's horseback ride from London itself. So his idea was to build a whole series of castles around London for, again, defensive purposes. Windsor Castle is the oldest continuously inhabited castle in the world. And of course, it's very much the weekend home of Her Majesty the Queen. And during, of course, lockdown, um, this is where the Queen has been um, holed up. And currently she's obviously um, like all of us under house arrest virtually. Um, but uh, she's got plenty of rooms. She's got 900 rooms to, uh, to, to run around in. And just in the middle of the complex is the round tower that I'm pointing out with the cursor. And that dates back to the 12th century. And it sits very high up the tower, uh, the castle on chalk cliffs about 100 feet above the River Thames, which you can see running off to the left hand side. So again, Windsor Castle is very much a product of the Middle Ages. But there's something else that's really important. Um, there's actually um, something that was founded in the Middle Ages, which is still um, a very important ceremony, which takes place at Windsor Castle today. And it's something called the Order of the Garter. Now, a very popular um, form of entertainment during the Middle Ages was something called jousting, um, of course, watched a lot by women, where knights, of course, uh, you know, tried to uh, shatter each other's lances on horseback. Um, and in 1344, King Edward III, there are lots of King Edwards to, uh, to negotiate in the Middle Ages, he was so impressed by the spectacular tournament of jousting that he saw at Windsor Castle that he decided that he was going to refound an uh, of an ancient institution called the Round Table, um, which went all the way back to the legend of King Arthur. And he created something called um, the Order of the Garter. Um, now, this requires some explanation. The Order of the Garter remembered an occasion when King Edward III um, had been dancing with his mistress at Windsor Castle. She'd lost her garter during the dance. The king retrieved the garter and rather suggestively put it on his own leg. Now, the court, of course, all sniggered with laughter at this. And the king, remember, who is speaking French, says to all of the courtiers, on y soit qui mal y pense, which means evil be to him that evil 
thinks. And this became the motto of the Order of the Garter. So the Order of the Garter was um, 24 knights that were appointed by the king, and 24 knights was exactly the number of knights you needed for two jousting teams. This is the king himself. And can you see he's actually got the uh, shield with the red cross on it. Now, St. George was the patron saint of the Order of the Garter. And this is the French phrase around the edge of the shield. Now, why am I mentioning that to you? Because guess what? The Order of the Garter still exists today. It's actually the oldest um, order of chivalry anywhere in the world. This is now a close up of the chapel of St. George within the grounds of Windsor Castle, which was built by King Edward III to be the spiritual home of the Order of the Garter. And you can see there's a procession taking place just there, leading up the steps into the chapel. And this is Garter Day, which takes place in June every single year. And just to prove the point, here is Her Majesty the Queen leading the Garter procession. This is, uh, I believe, not last year, maybe two years ago. Um, so today, still the Queen appoints the Knights of the Garter. There are still 24 of them, maximum. Um, nowadays, of course, they are uh, both male and female. And whilst they were limited to the aristocracy in the Middle Ages, today, the Knights of the Garter come from a variety of backgrounds. And what makes it very special is they are personally appointed by the Queen. The, the government doesn't really play a part in it. And generally, they're people that have contributed to the life of the nation or people that have served the sovereign personally. Uh, the Prince of Wales on the left, Prince Charles and Prince William on the right are also uh, knights of the Order of the Garter. And just to give you um, one of the current members of the Order of the Garter, the man on the right there is Lord Sainsbury. I think he's 93 years old this year. And he is the president of Sainsbury's Grocery Stores, which many of you will know, uh, of course, if you live here or maybe if you've visited. Um, also, Sir John Major, who was a f uh, one of our former prime ministers, he is also a Knight of the Garter. So I just thought I'd mention that because it, it's a medieval institution which is still very much alive and well today. And you can see there's the Garter badge on the Garter robes. Okay, so we're gonna go back now over to uh, Westminster. Um, so there we were looking at Westminster Hall and Westminster Abbey. But now we're going to go up here and we're going to trace a journey back towards the city of London. Just notice here there's an area called Charing Cross. Now Charing was a medieval village. It would have been pronounced Charinge in the Middle Ages. Um, and we think it comes from an old English word meaning Kieran, literally a, a bend in the river. So can you see how the River Thames actually turns or bends at that point? Um, so it was a little medieval village. And today Trafalgar Square sits on the site of where the medieval village of Charing was located. Now, some people think that the word Charing might have come from the French, and they think it might be a corruption of um, La Chereine. And if you speak French, you'll know that La Chereine means darling or dear queen. And that's because in the late 1200s, there was a monument that was erected on the site of the village, um, and it was dedicated to a much beloved medieval queen, and her name was Eleanor of Castile. And if we were to walk just along from Trafalgar Square, um, along this road, which is called the Strand, which we can still do today, it's still the main road that links Westminster and the city, we would find a copy of the medieval monument to Queen Eleanor of Castile. And here it is. Now, Queen Eleanor of Castile was the wife of King Edward I. So remember him, Hammer of the Scots, the coronation chair. Um, she died uh, whilst visiting uh, Edward during one of his visits up to Scotland. And they were very happily married. It was one of the great romances of the Middle Ages. And he died heart she died, he was heartbroken. And her body was carried all the way across England, back to London, a 12 day journey. And every place that the body stopped overnight, a cross was built. And these were known as the Eleanor Crosses. And the final stop was 
in the medieval village of Charing before she was taken to Westminster Abbey, where in fact she is buried next to her husband today. Um, now, what you see here, in fact, is a Victorian copy of the cross because the cross was actually pulled down in the 1600s by Oliver Cromwell. Um, that's another story for another time. But it was rebuilt in the Victorian era in the 19th century to draw attention to a new railway station, which is today Charing Cross Railway Station. Some of you uh, will recognize that. But that's an, a nice close up image of Eleanor of Castile. There she is, look, with the orb and the scepter. And she was a very big patron of the medieval church. So in fact, in that little depiction there, she's holding a model of the church itself. So there it is, you know, people look at it every day when they come out of Charing Cross Station, they've probably got no idea what, what this, this strange looking um, monument is, but it's a link to the medieval past. Um, now, if we move a little bit further along the strand, along from the Eleanor Cross or the Charing Cross, we would come to one of London's great luxury hotels. Maybe some of you have stayed there when you visited London in the past, or maybe you're hoping to stay there once lockdown is over. Um, this is the entrance to the Savoy Hotel, and it was built as one of, well, really London's first luxury hotel. But if we went back to the Middle Ages, um, what would have stood on the site of the Savoy Hotel was a great medieval palace called the Savoy Palace. And in fact, the whole of the Strand, the whole of that street would have been lined with medieval palaces belonging to bishops and aristocrats and occasionally monarchs as well. And what I rather like is that as you look at the entrance to the Savoy Hotel from the Strand, um, it still has the layout of what would have been the gatehouse that led into the medieval palace. So the palace was called the Savoy Palace. And you'll notice, if you look carefully on the top of the canopy of the Savoy, there is in fact a statue. Let's have a closer look at it. There's a medieval knight. That's Peter, the Count of Savoy. And he was the cousin in law of King Henry III. And he was given land there in the 1200s on which the site of the Savoy Palace was built. And amazingly, the Savoy Palace survived in, well, in part, right up until the 19th century. It was actually burned down the Savoy Palace during something called the Peasants' Revolt in 1381, which I'm going to return to a little bit later on. So we're going to move along from the Savoy and we're going to head a little bit further east, uh, um, back towards the city of London. But we're now going to pay a visit to another outstanding medieval church. And what you see here is a rare surviving round church in London, and this is called the Temple Church. Now, the Temple Church was built as the headquarters of a group of crusading knights who were, in fact, monks who were set up to basically reclaim Jerusalem in the Holy Land from the Muslims for the Christians. And this group of knights. Um, you've probably heard of them. I've put their image up there just so you can remind yourselves. They're known as the Knights Templar, and they wear white tunics with red crosses, and they are immune to all laws. The only person they answer to in medieval Europe is the Pope, the head of the church in Rome. Um, and um, they had a very strict code of conduct, the Knights Templar, and one of the things that they were not allowed to wear, in fact, um, it was said that we prohibit pointed shoes and shoelaces and forbid any brother, brother to wear them, for it is manifest and well known that these abominable things belong to pagans. And I couldn't help but resist show you the pointy shoes again, because the pointy shoes were considered to be pagan, not allowed to be worn by the Knights Templar. Now, what they do, these Knights Templar, is they protect Christian pilgrims who are en route to the Holy Land, um, and they build here in London a copy of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is located in Jerusalem. And they build it in 1185. So it's still very much in that Romanesque style with those rounded Romanesque windows. Um, and inside, when you visit the church today, you will find the effigies of uh, the medieval Knights Templar. Um, there is actually an extension built onto the church, which was built in the 1200s by King Henry III, who gave us Westminster Abbey, um, in the Gothic style. So you've got the Romanesque style and the Gothic style sitting side by side 
with each other. Now, without going into the whole story of the Knights Templar, fascinating though it is, um, on Friday the 13th, October the 13th, 1304, the Knights Templar were rounded up, they were tortured, they were abused, they were hunted down um, and driven underground. And that's why, by the way, Friday the 13th is uh, considered to be an unlucky day for many cultures across the world. Um, and their land was effectively seized and eventually it was given over to the legal profession. And by the 1600s, this land was now in the hands of the lawyers and it is still today. So this is known as the inner temple. Next to it is the middle temple. And to the north, we have the Gray's Inn and the, uh, the Lincoln's Inn. And those are the four inns of court where barristers meet to practice um, the law still today. Um, and um, if you're interested, we, we do a virtual tour of legal London, actually, which goes into a little bit more detail about it. Um, now, speaking of the law, it's in the 1200s that another medieval king actually has himself barricaded in the temple to protect himself from his rebellious barons. And this is one of our least successful medieval monarchs. Um, I couldn't help but resist putting up an image of the Disney um, uh, illustr uh, Disney um, personification of the king. This is King John. And King John ruled from 1199 to 1216. And if you've seen the Robin Hood Disney movie, um, this is how King John is depicted because, of course, Robin Hood was the outlaw that lived um, at this time uh, in Nottingham. Um, now, King John was an authoritarian bully, um, a, a rather petulant child. Uh, he was obsessed with power, money, and he saw political power as a way to get more of it, very manipulated by other people. And he punished all those who decided to speak out against him. Goodness me, does that sound familiar to you? given the light of recent events. Hmm. Anyway, well, in the early 1200s, the king fell out big time with the church and his um, nobles, his barons, and he was forced to negotiate with uh, the barons. And as a result of this negotiation, a charter was drawn up. It was known as the Great Charter, but it was named in Latin, the Magna Carta. And there's King John, uh, sitting down with the barons, um, forced to sign it. Um, and of course, the Magna Carta was um, drawn up on June the 15th, 1215, and really the foundations of the English legal system, and thus the foundation of many legal systems all over the world. And really the first time that we have the concept of ordinary people having rights. No one is above the law, including the king. And we still have four original copies of the Magna Carta, uh, two of which can be seen in London um, at the British Library. So, um, so I always think, uh, you know, that's a really key um, thing to mention. And there were 67 clauses contained within Magna Carta, and perhaps the most important that we still, of course, uphold today is no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or dispossessed or outlawed or exiled or in any way ruined, nor will we, the king and his henchmen, go or send against him except by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. So. Uh, you know, the right to trial by jury um, is still something we very much hold dear today in the English legal system. So that's uh, King John. By the way, does anyone know, um, this is a question for you, you can put it into the chat. Um, anyone know where where the Magna Carta was actually, uh, well, it wasn't really signed, it was sealed, but where, where, was it, where was it sealed? So you can put it in the chat and we'll, we'll come back to it later. Now we're going to move, move a little bit now further. We're going to move to an area slightly north of the um, city of London. And this area is called the Smithfield. Now Smithfield, uh, th this is uh, the view of it today, very important uh, part of medieval London. And what you can see just here is what was once the location of the most important medieval meat market in London. And in fact, this building today is still a working meat market. Um, it's where, you know, all the restaurateurs go to get the best cuts of meat for the hotel restaurants and all the all the top restaurants in the country. Um, you've got an area here which is called, um, well, that's the centre of the Smithfield. And just here, where I've dropped a pin, you've got uh, London's oldest surviving medieval church. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that next. Um, just to give you an idea of what this area looked like in the Middle Ages, there's a map of it. 
well, there are two maps of it. It's called the Schmite Field or the Smythe Field. Literally meant the smooth field. It's where uh, cattle would have grazed, where they would have been fattened up before they were slaughtered at the meat market. But here you can see it again. There's the Smith Field. But it's this area that we're really looking at. And this is the Priory Church of St. Bartholomew the Great that was built um, from 1123 onwards. And at the same time that the church was built, this hospital was built next to it, and that is St. Bartholomew's Hospital. We know it better today simply as St. Bart's, but the church and the hospital founded in the 12th century. So let's go and have a look at the church. This is the outside of the church of St. Bartholomew the Great, and the outside of it has been uh, quite, uh, you know, ad adapted um, and um, mo modified, particularly in the Victorian period. But as you'll see when we get inside, um, it still retains its wonderful medieval interior. Uh, so who was responsible for building the church? Well, just above the entrance, you can see there's a man um, holding a model of the church. And that man is called Rahir. And Ran Rahir was a medieval monk. He was actually a court jester uh, to the court of King Henry the First. And the story goes that, well, what happened was that um, King Henry lost his son in the terrible uh, drowning disaster called the White Ship Disaster. And the whole medieval court went into mourning. And it was said that the king never smiled again. And Rahair, the monk, decided to um, he, did, he decided to give up being a court jester and decided to go on a pilgrimage to Rome. And when he was in the parish of St. Bartholomew, he contracted malaria. And apparently he said a prayer um, to um, uh, St. Bartholomew and St. Bartholomew made him well on the condition that when he got back to England, he built a church and a hospital dedicated for the care of the poor and the sick. So that is the origin of the building of the church and the hospital. So let's go inside. And if we were to go inside the church, um, we would come across this extraordinary uh, contemporary statue of St. Bartholomew to whom the church is dedicated. Now, St. Bartholomew was one of the most popular saints in the Middle Ages. And don't forget, remember, the church dominates your life. And of course, the lives of the saints um, are told on the walls of the churches, in statues of the saints. Um, and it's a constant reminder, of course, that if you don't uh, behave yourself, if you don't go to church, if you don't be a good Christian, then you're going to burn in the fires of hell forever. Or perhaps even worse, you're going to end up like St. Bartholomew, who was flayed alive. And you can see his, um, the statue depicts poor St. Bartholomew holding his skin over his uh, arm with a flaying knife just there in his hand. And that, by the way, was done by Damien Hirst, who is one of our leading contemporary artists in Britain. And it's uh, permanently uh, the property of the of the church today. But here is the church. Just look at it. Isn't it absolutely wonderful? Um, this is uh, a view sort of from really uh, above looking down the nave. But what I want you to notice is um, the bottom or the ground floor of the church has those rounded arches. So they were built in the 12th century. Um, but later on, the church was made bigger. And you see on the top, you've got pointed arches. So you can see a really great example there of the Norman style, the Romanesque style, moving into the Gothic style, all in one building. Um, and it, 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 people often don't know about St. Bartholomew the Great. It's one of the great hidden treasures of London, still very much a working church but um, also a very popular movie location, particularly for, um, you know, uh, period films. So I urge you to visit St. Bartholomew the Great next time you're in London. Now, uh, if we were to go behind the church, um, we would find uh, an area called the Charter House. Um, now today, if we go into, into the Charter House, square, which is this lovely green area just to the right. It's very peaceful. Um, but had we been here in 1348, we would have seen something quite different happening indeed. Um, in 1348, in the late summer, disaster strikes London, the Great Plague, or what became known as the Black Death to us now, um, which was, uh, it came from Asia, um, and it, uh, it basically devastated London, England and most of Western Europe. And in about nine months, 40,000 
out of 100,000 Londoners die from the Black Death, which of course is a, um, a bacteria brought over by rats, but spread by fleas. Um, and so many people were dying in the summer of 1348 uh, that the, there, weren't, there wasn't room in the churchyards to bury them. So a man called Walter de Manny decided to purchase some land, about 13 acres of land on the north side of the city right here. And he created a burial site for the plague victims. Um, in the early 2000s, when we were building a cross rail, which is our um, yet to be completed uh, transportation extension in London, they were digging down in the middle of Charterhouse Square and they found 25 uh, skeletons, which have now been verified as being black death victims. Uh, they think there might be as many as up to 10,000 bodies buried underneath that site uh, today. Now, um, next to the green space is this building. This is called the Charter House. Um, and in 1371, so about 25 years after the Black Death, Sir Walter Manny left a portion of land um, for the founding of a monastery for Carthusian monks to pray for the souls of the victims of the Black Death. And he instructed that his own body should be buried within the uh, precincts of the Charter House. Um, and if you visit the Charter House today, there is a museum uh, and you can go in and you can see one of the skeletons that was dug up from that dig about eight years ago in Charterhouse Square. And skeletons are a very useful guide to the Middle Ages, by the way, because, um, because they give us an idea about heights. We often think that people in the Middle Ages were sh much shorter than we were. Actually, average height of a man, five feet, seven inches. Uh, women were about inch and a half, two inches shorter than that. So actually, not really much shorter than the average height of people today. And by the way, we always think about people's teeth being absolutely awful in the Middle Ages. There were far fewer cavities in um, medieval skeletons than we have today, largely because sugar was not uh, really available to medieval people uh, and neither were, you know, sort of refined um, goods. So that's an interesting thing. By the way, of course, people didn't really understand the causes of, of the Black Death at that time. They didn't understand the, obviously, the concept of bacteria. And of course, they blamed it on people's sins. They blamed it on, you know, excess. And one of the things that was blamed um, for the Black Death was uh, excess of fashion. And those pointy shoes are back again because the pointy shoes were considered to be um, possibly one of the causes of um, the punishment sent by God to punish Londoners for their sins. So how about that? Those poor shoes, they do get a rough ride. Um, OK. Um, now, the Black Death had huge consequences for uh, not just London, but for Western Europe, because now the workforce is reduced by about a third to half, which means, of course, that the people that are working the land, the peasants, now, of course, um, there are fewer of them, so they can demand higher wages. And finally, in 1381, um, King Richard II decides to introduce a tax to England called the poll tax, which effectively is a tax where everybody pays the same amount of money, irrespective of whether they are poor or rich. And the poor have had enough of this, and they decide they're going to protest. And they march from actually areas of Kent, Essex, into London. Um, they are actually let in um, over London Bridge. And uh, the houses and palaces were burned, including the Savoy Palace. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the church, was beheaded. Um, and 14-year-old um, King Richard II, remember him, he was actually locked up in the Tower of London. Um, now, a meeting was held on the site of the Smithfield between the rebels and the teenage king, he was only 14 years old, to try and negotiate um, a peace settlement. And this is a meeting uh, of on the Smithfield uh, depicted there. And you might just notice the Church of St. Bartholomew is just in the background of the image. Now, initially, the, the, the negotiation seemed to go OK until, I'm afraid, disaster struck when the leader of the rebels, a man called Watt Tyler, was pulled off his horse, as you can see there, and he was actually stabbed by the Lord Mayor of London, a man called William Walworth. Mayhem ensued, and um, although the king placated the rebels, promised reform, uh, the mob was dispersed. Eventually, um, King Richard broke all his promises. But it really was a very important t a moment because it's really the first major protest by ordinary people against 
uh, you know, the status quo. Uh, now, it all seems gloom and doom, doesn't it? But it wasn't all gloom and doom. Um, if you went to the Smithfield in August in the Middle Ages, you went to the St. Bartholomew's Fair, and that was a great big, basically, two-week um, booze up uh, where, where people got drunk and they, they ate to excess. Um, and you could see um, acrobats. Uh, and this is a wonderful image um, of, of a female acrobat from the Middle Ages. And we know about her. Her name was Matilda Makejoy, and she was called a saltatrix an acrobatic dancer. And she very famously apparently danced in the nude for King Edward I in the 1200s. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, people were entertained. Uh, and I can't resist but telling you one of the other fantastic um, forms of entertainment in the Middle Ages. Um, jesters were, were very popular. We've talked about Rahair, but this is an image um, on the right-hand side of a very popular form of entertainment, um, flatulism, um, which is farting, essentially. And in the 12th century, there was a very famous uh, medieval flatulist. His name was Roland Le Fartaire, again, French, Le Fartaire. And his only requirement each Christmas was um, to perform um, one jump, one whistle, and one fart for King Henry III. And he was actually given 30 acres of land and a manor house in Suffolk in the east of England for that very important service. I just thought that, that, that's a lovely thing, you know, to think that, that farting uh, made people laugh just as it makes people laugh today, especially kids. Um, now there is, uh, uh, there are some chess pieces. Why have I put chess pieces on the screen? Because this is a very famous chess set that you would find if you went to the British Museum in London. And this is called the Lewis Chess Set or the Lewis Chessmen. And these chess pieces were found um, buried in the 1800s in a sand dune just off the west coast of Scotland. And they date back to the 12th century. And we think they're Norwegian in origin, um, but they were possibly stolen. We're not quite sure what happened to them or why they were found in Scotland, but it just proved that chess was an extremely popular board game um, in the Middle Ages. So they're one of the great treasures of the British Museum. Now, just moving on, uh, just of time, just a few more um, images to show you. We're just moving now from the Smithfield, which is up here, all the way down now to the um, heart of the city of London itself. And you can see there in purple, this is the most important church in the city of London. This is St Paul's Cathedral. So we've got Westminster Abbey, which is the royal church in Westminster. But for the people, this is the church. And the church that people would have known was a great big Gothic church. And the model of it um, is in the Museum of London still today. So there's the model of what the medieval church looked like. And it was built, um, well, there, there were several versions of St Paul's Cathedral, but this would have been built around about 1300. And it was still standing until 1666, uh, which of course is outside of our time period, but that's when the Great Fire of London destroyed it. Um, but that's the church that, that medieval Londoners would have known. And amazingly, it was a third bigger than the St Paul's Cathedral that we know and love today. And just to remind us of what that church looks like, that's the medieval, uh, sorry, that's the um, that's St Paul's Cathedral that we, that we know today, built in the Baroque style after the Great Fire in 1666. But, um, just, but, but it's still very much the, the mother church of the um, Diocese of London. Now, just to give you an idea of what's going on right in the heart of the city, here we've got um, a street running um, from St Paul's Cathedral right through um, from west to east, and this is Cheapside. And Cheapside was the main shopping street of the city of London. Uh, cheap is an old English word for uh, market. So literally, um, on the cheap meant at the market. And there are lots of little streets running up to the north and down to the south. And many of the streets reflect the trades that were prevalent at that time. So this street is called Wood Street, um, which is where, in fact, you bought flat pack medieval houses. So like, you know, a medieval version of Ikea. Um, you've got Ironmonger Lane, which is just uh, here where you bought sort of pots and pans. Um, here you've got um, uh, uh, Friday Street. Now, Friday Street, interesting, is where, where you bought fish because fish very important part of the medieval diet was only generally eaten on Fridays. Um, and that's where, uh, and on other holy days in the Christian calendar, but that's where you bought uh, your fish. 
from the fish sellers on Friday Street. You also had Bread Street, which is where the bakers traded. Um, and you've also got a street here, interestingly, called Old Jewry. And Old Jewry was where you had um, the Jewish community. There was a very big, thriving Jewish community in the heart of the city right up until 1290. And in a very shameful period of our medieval history, King Edward I, Hammer of the Scots, expelled all the Jews out of um, England. Uh, and there were no Jews officially in England for 350 years um, until the time of Oliver Cromwell. And that's because the Jews were wrongfully accused of counterfeiting coins. Uh, and, and of course, you know, they sold, um, um, they charged interest on money lending, which of course was one of the only jobs that Jews were allowed to do. Uh, but, but they were accused basically of um, of embezzlement, so, so they were all expelled. So, but but the name still survives today. Uh, one of the other things, by the way, that uh, you would have found being made in the city of London in the Middle Ages was the manufacture of uh, wooden shoes. Now, these aren't the pointy shoes; these are platform shoes, which were put over your very nice leather shoes or your silk shoes, or your satin shoes, to protect you from the mud and the muck that you would have experienced as you came out onto those uh, filthy, dirty medieval streets. Um, and they're called patterns. Patterns. They're basically wooden clogs and they were found all over medieval Europe. Um, so I just thought uh, that was a nice. And we have a church still today in the city of London called the Church of St. Marguerite Patterns. And it was the church of the pattern makers. Um, okay, now moving on. Uh, that, that, by the way, today is, is an aerial view of um, the same area that I've just been talking about. So there's St. Paul's Cathedral, there's Cheapside, and you notice how those medieval streets are still there. So they're still, they still follow the, the medieval pattern that you would have found in the Middle Ages, going north and south. And just here is a very important building, still at the heart of the city. I'm gonna have a quick look at it, and it's called the Guild Hall. Um, and the Guild Hall is still today the headquarters of the government of the City of London. Now, the City of London is only one square mile in area, but it still retains the um, independence from the government in, um, in Westminster. Um, and that's largely thanks to the Magna Carta. And in the Magna Carta, King John recognized the rights of the City of London, uh, which had been around for centuries beforehand. Now, the Guildhall is where we elect still today the Lord Mayor of the City of London, who is the head of the square mile. Um, and the walls that you can see there are actually medieval. So those walls date back to 1411. Um, so, so it's a medieval building, even though it was damaged in World War II. Um, there's our clause from the Magna Carta. Um, and the other thing that's really important to understand about the Middle Ages is that if you were part of a trade, uh, if you were a baker or a butcher or uh, one of two types of candle maker, or you're an ironmonger, or you're a pattern shoemaker, you had to belong to a guild. And by the Middle Ages, um, these guilds were extremely powerful, and, and you, couldn't, you couldn't work within the trade or the craft unless you belonged to the guild. And those guilds still survive today in the form of what we know at what we call livery companies. Um, and many of them uh, still have their halls in the city of London. We have the Goldsmiths Hall there, the Grocers Hall. Uh, we have the Vintners Hall, the winemakers. And um, the reason I mention that is because um, although most of these companies today are largely charitable organizations, um, they are still actively involved in the election of the Lord Mayor of the City of London. Um, so the first Lord Mayor was elected in 1189. His name was Henry Fitz Aylwin. 1189, so that's 800 years ago. And I just thought I'd show you an image today of the current Lord Mayor of the City of London. And there he is, that's William Russell. So he is the current office holder and normally you hold office for just one year, although because of COVID, the Lord Mayor is currently serving a second term this year. And that shows you inside the Guildhall, the election of the Lord Mayor that takes place every year in September. So we have this mad medieval election system that still forms the basis of the, um, the elections of the city of London to this day. Now I've really, I've really um, skimmed over a lot of that because it's quite complicated, but it just gives you a, a little sense of it. Uh, the most famous, perhaps, Lord Mayor 
of the City of London was a man called Dick Whittington. Those of you that are, live in the UK will certainly have heard of Dick Whittington, and he was Lord Mayor in the late 1300s, early 1400s. He actually built the Guildhall that we know today, and he was a member of the Mercer's Company, which was and still is the wealthiest and most powerful of all of those medieval guilds. And they still own an awful lot of land, um, not just in the city of London, but elsewhere. Uh, and they give away an awful lot of money every year in terms of charity. And there's a church in the city that was built by Dick Whittington. It's called St. Michael Paternoster Royal, and it's still there um, today. And Dick Whittington is buried somewhere underneath the altar of the church. And by the way, God bless Dick Whittington because he gave us the first public toilets in London in the Middle Ages, which actually sat overhanging the River Thames, uh, and people sat in rows with their bums hanging over the edge, and the uh, the poo went straight down into the river, which was considered to be a very um, um, modern form of sanitation at the time. Now, we're nearly finished, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, just a, a, a few more quick things here. This is a model of the only bridge that crossed over the River Thames in the Middle Ages. Um, it's called London Bridge. And the Romans had built a bridge even 2000 years ago, but they would have been wooden bridges. But the first stone bridge was built by 1207 AD. And amazingly, the bridge survived for 600 years up until the 1800s. And that model of the bridge is to be found in one of our city churches. And you can actually go into the church, it's called St Magnus the Martyr. It's right next to the modern London Bridge today. And you can see this wonderful model and it gives you a real feel for medieval uh, bridge life. So let's have a look at it just in detail. Uh, the bridge was uh, 900 feet long. The river was much wider in those days and it was covered in houses and um, shops. Um, and there was only a very narrow passage for people and uh, horses and carts to cross over it. So it was extremely congested and busy. Um, this gives you an idea of the kind of houses that people lived in on the bridge. Of course, they were wooden houses predominantly um, with the ground floor, uh, the first floor overhanging the ground floor, the second floor overhanging the first floor um, with, of course, mostly thatched roofs. Um, uh, and the process was called jettying. Um, in the middle of the bridge was a chapel dedicated to Thomas a Becket. Now, Thomas a Becket was one of the most famous uh, medieval saints. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had been murdered in his own cathedral in Canterbury um, in Kent in 1170 AD. And pilgrims went on um, essentially weekend breaks down to um, Canterbury to pay their respects to the remains of Thomas a Becket. And still today, Canterbury Cathedral, you can visit, uh, pilgrims still go today to visit the shrine of Thomas a Becket. Um, and we'll, we'll mention that again just in a moment. Uh, also at the end of London Bridge, so as you, as you crossed over the bridge to the south side of the river, there was a gatehouse. And just as a reminder, um, um, not to commit any willful acts against the king, um, you would have seen the heads of traitors on spikes on the top of the gatehouse. So they look like little olives on sticks, don't they, in the model? But those were the heads of traitors, and you would have been either beheaded just outside the Tower of London, or possibly, in the case of William Wallace, hung, drawn, and quartered on the Smithfield, um, and then you would have your head would have been displayed on London Bridge. Now, if we cross over London Bridge to the south side today, we would find another great survivor of the Middle Ages, this palace, which was built by the Bishop of Winchester in the 12th century, and um, it was the Bishop's London residence. And um, this is a map of the south side of the river uh, showing you, not in great detail, but that is roughly where the palace was located, and yet another very important medieval church, which was um, called St Mary Overy, which is today Southwark Cathedral. Now, I'm, the reason I mentioned that was, you, why would you go to the south side of the river? Well, you went to the south side of the river because along the river, right along here, um, along from the Bishop's Palace, were the medieval brothels, and they were known as the stews. Um, and this is where you went, um, gentlemen, mostly, to have a good time. Um, and Flemish women were brothel keepers, and they, and they ran the brothels. And by the way, the rents were collected by the Bishop of Winchester, who owned the land. So the church turned a blind eye towards prostitution on the south side of the river, and the women were known as the Winchester geese. And if you caught a sexually transmitted disease at the time, it was called um, being bitten by the Winchester goose. And uh, 
we think that the origin of goosebumps possibly comes from uh, being bitten by the Winchester geese from the medieval brothels. Uh, prostitutes in the Middle Ages, of course, were not allowed to be buried in consecrated ground. Um, and amazingly, just a few minutes walk from um, London Bridge, we would find the Crossbones Graveyard. This is where uh, we hundreds of medieval prostitutes were buried in unconsecrated ground, uh, an area known as the Outcast Dead. Um, and it was still in use right up until the 19th century. I promise we're nearly finished. Um, we go around the corner from that graveyard and we come across um, a street called Borough High Street. And this um, black and white photograph shows you um, a Victorian image of an inn. And it was called the Tabard Inn. And the Tabard Inn uh, went all the way back to the Middle Ages. And you'll notice here an image of people sitting around a table having a meal. And this is an image of the pilgrims that were having their supper before they left the Tabard Inn um, and headed out on their three day journey all the way down to Canterbury to pay their respects to the shrine of Thomas a Becket. Now, who was the person that wrote about um, these pilgrims very famously in the late 1300s, his name was Geoffrey Chaucer. And Geoffrey Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales. And of course, this is so important because um, he writes the Canterbury Tales in um, English, in the native tongue of ordinary everyday people, not in Latin, the language of the church, not in French, the language of the aristocracy, but in language that everyday people could understand. And really, many of the stories are very rude and very bawdy. And I think a lot of our, you know, English sense of humour, you think of the carry on films, you know, people sticking their backsides out of windows and things like that, all to be found in the stories of the pilgrims um, going to Canterbury. Um, these are medieval pilgrims badges that have been found um, in different parts of London, uh, showing you um, Thomas a Beckett's image on them. Um, and these are, uh, this is, by the way, a first edition of the Canterbury Tales that was printed in 1477 by William Caxton, who gave us the first printing press in London. He set it up just in the precincts of Westminster Abbey, and we believe this was the first substantial book to be printed in England, the Canterbury Tales, and the British Library holds that original copy still today. Now we are promised, I promise we are nearly finished here and we are ending as we began at the Tower of London. And we are looking at um, a memorial tablet which is found in one of those medieval towers to King Henry VI. Now in the middle of the 1400s, we have something called the Wars of the Roses. And all we really need to understand about, about the Wars of the Roses is it was a battle between two rival houses of the royal family, the House of Lancaster and the House of York. The House of Lancaster represented by a red rose and the House of York represented by a um, white rose. Now, in 1471, King Henry VI, who was from the House of Lancaster, was captured by his Yorkist rival, Edward, Duke of York. And Henry was brought to um, his own tower, the Tower of London, and he was under house arrest. And on the 21st of May, 1471, he was praying in the chapel, in the tower, the Wakefield Tower, the Tower of London, and he was set upon by persons unknown. His brains were dashed onto the chapel floor and he was killed. And he was replaced by his Yorkist rival, Edward IV in 1471. Um, this is the exterior of the tower where that all happened. And it's that round tower just on the left-hand side. So this was a very brutal murder indeed. Now to the right of that round tower is that square tower. And that is called the Bloody Tower. And something else happened in the Bloody Tower in 1483. Now in 1471, Edward, Duke of York becomes King Edward IV. He dies in 1483 and he leaves two sons, Edward V, who is only 12 years old, and Richard, Duke of York, who is only nine years old. Now, Edward V is too young at 12 years old to rule in his own right. So his uncle is appointed to be the um, protector of the two young boys. And his name is Richard, Duke of Gloucester. And legend has it that in July 1483, in this room, in that square tower, what is now known as the Bloody Tower, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, possibly had his two nephews um, killed. 
um, in order to pave his own way to the throne. And later that year, he had himself crowned King Richard III in Westminster Abbey. Two years later, King Richard III was defeated in battle by another rival, Henry Tudor, from the House of Lancaster. And that year, 1485, marks the end of the Middle Ages officially and the beginning of the Tudor period and the beginning of modern Britain. But that's where I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, our story has to end today. So we began with the death of a king, King Harold, back in 1066, and we've ended with the death of a king in 1485. And by the way, poor King Edward V, who didn't make it to the throne, was the other Edward who wasn't crowned in Westminster Abbey, although both their remains were discovered in the 1670s and the two young princes in the tower, their remains are in Westminster Abbey today. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention today. I just want to remind you that if you want to learn more about London in all of its myriad forms, if you want to enjoy the world of virtual tours, please go to our website, www.walks.com slash London virtual tours, or just go to walks.com and it will direct you to all of the 200 virtual tours that we're currently offering in this um, period of lockdown. Those are my details, Simon Whitehouse, London Blue Badge Guy, but um, I work for London Walks predominantly. That's my direct email address there, bbgsimon at gmail.com. My Twitter handle is at Simon. My Instagram, please follow me on Instagram and London Walks as well, um, at Blue Badge Simon or London Walks official. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you on lots more virtual tours in the future. So I thank you for your kind attention, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I think we've overrun a little bit um, there, but I hope that wasn't uh, too much for you. Um, and over to um, Robert. Wow, Simon, awesome that was. Thank you. Great job. So uh, FYI, we had over 950 people watching on Zoom and then a lot oh my more goodness. also on um, Facebook Live. Thank you. So thank you. For your, for, thank you, everyone. Thank you. So thanks, everyone, for around the world for joining us. So um, just a couple of quick questions. So we, because we have so many people, it's going to be impossible to answer all the questions that people put in the comments. So unfortunately for that. Um, one question for you, though, you mentioned at the start of the program, that this is an eight series long program on the history of London and then there's another one of these that you personally do which which one is that one because we would have to schedule that with you at some point in time in the future and I can notify people um, that are here today when that will be so what's the other one that you do on the history of London oh so the other the other one that I do is is Stuart London so that's um that's the 17th century okay awesome yeah. well we'll have to work on that at some point in time in the future and we're joined by David Tucker the Head honcho of London Walks. Hi, David. Thanks so much for joining us and helping oh, Simon and I organize this. Did you want to share anything for a minute or two? Tell us about yourself well, and London Walks. You know, I, I've been with Simon many times and I always learn from him. Uh, he's just such a star. Uh, he's done about, you must have about 20 or 22 of these that you've done now that you've produced, Simon. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right, David. Yeah, yeah, about that now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when, when's the next one? There's a, there's a theater one coming up, isn't there? Theater Land? Oh, yes. In fact, the, this very evening, this very evening at seven o'clock, I'm going to be doing uh, my, my theater land tour, which is called Curtain Up, the story of London's theater land. Um, yeah. um, great. I'm really glad people have enjoyed it. That's great. Oh, by the way, I must just, uh, before people just have to disappear, because I know we overran slightly, but um, uh, wh yes, where was the Magna Carta signed? That was m my little question to you. Well, it was signed at the bottom, of course, wasn't it? It was signed. <laughs> it's my little joke to you. No, no, yes. No, you're quite right. It was signed at Runnymede, uh, which is a little area very close to, to Windsor in Berkshire. And you can go and visit, you can go and visit the, the monument to the signing of the Magna Carta today. Yeah. And Robert, people I, I saw answered that correctly. Well, not the that if the answer if the correct answer was the bottom, no one answered that correctly, but some people did answer. That, that. is the correct answer. At the bottom is the is the correct <laughs> answer. May, may I just have a minute or so then, Robert? Uh, just a, yeah, sure. a, one or two points. Um, London Walks is the oldest urban walking tour company in the world. It's been going now 52 years. And, you know, Mary and I uh, own it, but it's run essentially as a guides cooperative. It's run on a profit share uh, basis. And that's the reason. And in fact, it's the only reason it's possible uh, to have guides of this caliber. I mean, London has, London Walks has four lawyers. It's got a barrister and, and three solicitors on the team. Uh, it's got the former editor of independent television news, subsequently the CEO. Uh, I can remember my best American pal when I told him 
uh, that we got Stuart Purvis uh, to, to, to do a, a Spies of Hampstead walk for him. David knows London very well. And he said, you got Stuart Purvis to do Spies of, of, uh, of Hampstead. That's like getting Dan Rather to do Dealey Plaza. Uh, we've got museum curators. We've got a University College London uh, geologist guiding for us. We've got Royal Shakespeare Company actors. Uh, we've got a physician, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that you cannot uh, attract and keep guides of that caliber uh, you know, by paying uh, uh, McDonald's uh, wages. Uh, so it, it's, it's run on this, uh, this as a guides cooperative basis. And that's the key to the whole thing. But what you guys could do for us is you know, to help spread the word. We've always been dependent on, on word of mouth, but just get the word out. Uh, uh, you know, you could t tell a friend before they're coming to London to look up uh, London Walks, uh, you know, put up a good review for us, maybe go on some of the virtual tours, uh, et cetera. It's been a really tough time for us. I mean, uh, the virtual tours have slowed the rate of descent of this little ship a little bit. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to be frank here. You know, we need help. Uh, and word of mouth from a lot of compatriots of mine, uh, well-educated, uh, fun uh, Yanks. And, and not, I mean, there's people I see in the group from Brazil and Germany and elsewhere. Um, it would be much appreciated. So that's my spiel. Oh, no problem. So a question for the two of you. So before COVID, you know, when, when things were kind of normal, Simon, how many different types of in-person tours, like how many different topics would you do in-person tours on in and around London? And then um, David, kind of same question for you with your you and your team. So Simon, we'll let you go first. Well, for myself, I guess, oh gosh, it's so difficult to say. I probably, I mean, maybe like 25, 30, oh, wow. 35 different <laughs> themes, subjects. I mean, oh, awesome. quite literally, I, I guide just about everything and anything. Um, oh, okay. uh, partly okay. thanks to London Walks, very vast repertoire of, of walks, which I've, I've, I've learned, you know, over the years. But I mean, literally everything, guiding the Tower of London, guiding Westminster Abbey, guiding the National Gallery, the British Museum, neighbourhoods like Covent Garden, um, St. James, Mayfair, the, the City of London. I mean, you name it. it you know, that's the great thing we, we as guides, we, we, you know, you wind us up and off we go. Okay, so as, our, long, or, as long as we're curious and, and we're interested, we're, we'll, we'll tell you a story uh, about just about anything. Okay. Isn't that right, David? I think, Absolutely. wouldn't you agree? Yeah. 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 So our organization is based in Washington, DC. Uh, we're Washington, DC history and culture. So thanks for everyone who's joining us from that. And um, in the past, before COVID, we organized trips to um, Philadelphia, we went to New York a few times, we went to Richmond and some other places. And so when we used to go to New York, it was like we'd hit like 30 some people would join us um, and without really any marketing. And we thought, oh, you know, at some point in time, we'll have to go overseas. We'll organize like a group trip to London and anybody that wants to come with us either by themselves or with their spouse or a significant other uh, is welcome to do so. So I was thinking at some point in time when COVID ends and life returns to normal, we'll organize a big group trip over there and anyone that wants to come hang out with the two of you we'll go do well, set that up that's great and we'll take care of all your guiding needs don't worry yeah, we'll yeah that's what would be so awesome yeah. about it we wouldn't have to we wouldn't have to go anywhere else and, and we'll break some bread with you as well after okay, the war awesome okay awesome <laughs> david what about similar question for you that your organization london walks any guesstimate on how many different types of programs you would offer in a yeah, year well i have a very good idea there's about you know there's so much history here uh, so there's about 500 different London walks in the oh full my repertoire. Gosh. <laughs> uh, and we were doing a, approximately for years, we've done approximately 100, 110 walk, public walks a week. Uh, and then another 40 to 50 private walks. I mean, sometimes there would be days when we had 30 private walks going out. So, uh, you know, at last count, there were something like 7,000 private walks going a, a year. Uh, and then I guess these, what does the figure come to? Uh, you know, 5,200 approximately uh, public walks. So 12,000 walks a year. Um, we, I'm we guessing think if there's a topic that someone wants to learn about in terms of London, you guys have it covered. <laughs> well, not always, but we're always, we're all ears. Um, we've had people, you know, write in and make suggestions and we put it out to these guides. Uh, and, you know, they are so creative. And they're so interested in, in everything that sometimes these walks have been created at the suggestion of a walker. 
guys, Simon, I talked to you about uh, doing your um, crown tour. I think in the in the U.S. in particular, there'd be a lot of interest. I mean, there'd be interest in that from everybody throughout the world, but particularly in the U.S., people are always interested in that uh, topic because we don't have the that type of stuff over here. Well, that's a case in point, Robert, because about three years ago when The Crown was first aired on Netflix, I mean, obviously, we, we do a lot of uh, different royal themed walks already, but we decided, well, let, let's let's take this idea and let's take people to the locations, um, the, the real life locations that, that, that we see and hear about in The Crown, and let's tell, let's separate the fact from the fiction with, with, the, with the real royal stories versus what we see on screen. And it was, it's proved popular. So we, have, we, we were in the process of turning it into a virtual, but uh, watch this space. It's coming, it's coming soon. Would you be able to share your screen one more time and put your contact information? Because a few people in the comments are saying that they didn't get it. So give people a, take a chance to take a screenshot of it. Or oh, a, yes, yes, of course. I'll do, I'll do that for you. Just give me a second. Um, Again, thanks everyone for joining us. It um, was really neat to have so many people from throughout the world and Sydney, Australia, and Brazil, and uh, may I add? Can you see so it? really fascinating. Oh, there you go. You just can you move? The, there you go. So yeah, Robert. if you want to get in touch yes. with um, London Walks or Simon, there you go. Take a screenshot of that or a picture because we're going to have to sign off in a, a minute or two because we have another program. Um, coming up in a few minutes. May, may I have 10 seconds, Robert? Yes, of course. Your group could use, uh, I mean, people can use us as a resource. I mean, we really care about high quality walking tours, not just in London, but all over the world. And we travel a lot. So if, if you know, if people want to write to us, I mean, we know who the best guide is in Sevilla, for example. Uh, we know who the best guide is in Oslo, in Paris, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, they, by all means, they, they should use us as a resource. Well, again, um, um, every, well, sorry, one, go ahead. And I believe there was a quite, there were a few questions about uh, people wanting to donate. So uh, I think Robert, uh, if they wanted to make donations, they can do donate directly to you via um, the Eventbrite page. That's um, correct. Well, that's closed because um, that was just for people to sign up beforehand. Can they, can someone send you a donation through like, um, uh, PayPal to your email? Uh, yes, actually. So you would do it. Uh, you can see my email address, bbgsimon at gmail.com. You would just do it through PayPal if you wish to. Yes. 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 Yeah, sorry. So yeah, David, Simon and I are like figuring, figuring, <laughs> figuring out this stuff as we go along. Cause this is like the first one of these programs we've had this uh, tr transatlantic uh, Zoom thing. So, but yeah, if you'd like to um, make a donation to Simon and his effort and support the work that he does, um, feel free to do that via PayPal to his email. And again, check out his Twitter and Instagram page. And then also um, take a look at Washington Walks. So lots of um, cool things going on there. And Simon, I'll catch up with you afterwards to do the, um, the part two. And whenever we schedule that, I'll be happy to email everyone that's on us uh, today with us. Excellent. To let them know about that. And I'd just, I just like to say a big thank you again to all those people today, or hundreds and hundreds of people that joined us today. Thank you for your kind attention and giving up your time. And uh, it's really great to be collaborating uh, with you, Robert, and obviously uh, Violin Walks. It's, likewise, it's likewise. fantastic. We really, it's really great. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe and have a great day. Yeah, have a great day, rest yeah. of your weekend, and we'll see you at some point in time in the near future. Thanks everyone. Fabulous. Thanks, Robert. Cheers. That was great.